Hey there, and welcome to the Confident Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Brooks. Join me as I sit down and chat with co-hosts, friends, and carefully curated guests and talk about all the things that empower you to become your best and most confident self. So let's get started. All right, ladies, welcome back. So today we have with us Changi Tobin. And Changi is the founder and CEO of the Black Swan Relationship Academy, where she entwines her experience and expertise to empower women to find love within themselves and cultivate fulfilling relationships. Changi has the ability to foster connection and create impact that is evident as she boasts a community of 100K across her social media channels. So welcome, Changi. I will, oh Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. What a Absolutely. pleasure. We are going to have an incredible conversation. Before we hit record, we just were talking about some of the shared interests, the passions. And really, this is what today's conversation will be about, is to harness those and discover those. Maybe sometimes they're a little bit dormant within us, but mm-hmm. for us to really harness, unleash, and step fully into our best and most confident selves. So I'd mm-hmm. love for you to share a little bit more about you and your story and how you got into the lines of works that you're in today. <laughs> you know, I always feel like to find your purpose is always in your pain. It's always in your, you know, I think we spend so much time doing where's my purpose and my it's in your pain. And so I guess my story would start from my pain. I got married at the age of 19. I was actually an immigrant from Zimbabwe and I, I moved here when I was 18 all by myself with big dreams. I was going to, you know, change the world as we all do when we're young. And I met my ex-husband around that time really quickly. And it was a whirlwind romance. I think I was just looking for a savior, really. I was new and, you know, I just needed somebody to save me. And he took me under his wing and bless his heart. He, you know, fathered me, really. And even though he wasn't much older. And we got married at the age of 19. But by the time I was 33, I had, I, I, I found I was not, I hate to use the phrase not happy because I was really traumatized. I had a lot of, the marriage had been very difficult. We were two young people who had a lot of trauma. I had a lot of severe trauma that I was completely oblivious to, raised in a very toxic home environment. I honestly didn't know what normal and functional was. Um, And he came from, you know, similar sort of trauma. So we're two very traumatized humans, very young, very isolated And I think it was really just our shared fate that held us together. But when I had my son, I realized I can't do this anymore because I'd really become very suicidal. You know, I was sort of praying for death and just really having these really dark thoughts. And so I knew or felt in my heart for sure that somebody will die here if we don't. And I think, you know, everybody walks up the aisle thinking we're going to be forever, you know. And, you know, it was really difficult to... It was life transforming for me because it was something that when it, it divorced or something that went against my faith, my belief, my convictions about relationships and love. But I knew that I'd poured everything that I had, which in fact, looking back now that I'm a professional, realized that it wasn't very much, you know, there wasn't much health in, in what I was pouring. So yeah, that was a, you know, traumatic journey, you know, left me homeless a few times with my son. You know, there's loads to be said about that. But eventually I got to a point where everybody was, I thought I'd never marry again. I was like, who, who cares? I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about men. I don't want to hear about marriage ever again. It doesn't work for people like me. And, you know, friends and family were like, you need to go back into dating. Look at you. You're such a lovely, co-. you know, the usual. And so I thought, well, it's been a year or so. Let me just jump back in there. But I was still the same unhealed, broken, messed up woman. So what did I do? I just went and created chaos, right? I just started attracting all the wrong men, allowed them to hurt me. I I always say to people, I got hurt more trying to date than I ever was in my marriage. And my marriage was not an easy one. I mean, my marriage was toxic, right? But I got hurt more in the dating world and more injured in the dating world than actually in my marriage. And that really led me to a come to Jesus moment, you know, a breakdown where I just felt, am I so unlovable? What's so irreparably broken about me? Why can't I just get the love I crave so deeply, you know? And I came to a a point where I remember 
I was stood up by this guy that I was, I just thought he was the one. And I'd had these moments multiple times. So I'm crying my eyes out because I've been stood up on a date. I've got mascara all over my eyes. And, and I just heard God say, take a picture of yourself. That's the most bizarre thing. So it was those old phones at the time. So I take my Blackberry, I think, and I take a picture of myself. And it's this mascara and I look horrible. And I saw for the first time what the broken image of me looked like. Because, you know, we fall apart and we cry, but we never see the ugly. People see us ugly cry and they see us break. But we, we never find a mirror to really see how ugly we look, you know. And I think it was the first time ever because I was in the beauty industry. I was a makeup artist at the highest possible level. I was always super glamorous. I was that girl on the outside that looked like her life was so together. And I'd bought into that too. I believed that's who I was, you know, intrinsically, internally. But it was just my mask. And when I saw that image of myself broken, I said, I don't want to be her anymore. But I'm not going to find her running around dating everything that walks. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to find her in what I'm doing. So because I'd done such a lot of personal development on my journey, read books, went to conferences, I knew the problem was me. I just didn't know where to start. But I remember thinking, well, we've got to stop the dating. So I took a three-year sabbatical where I stopped dating and I worked on my spiritual life. I worked on restoring my faith again because that had been broken. I didn't feel worthy of even having faith, having God. I didn't feel worthy of having love. I so many, so much broke that I took three years to really begin to come home. I always say to, to my clients and to my community, home. We've got to come home and that's always to self, right? Always to, even coming to God is coming to self because that's where he's at the self part. So that three-year journey, I, I healed, you know, I, I've been doing 13 years worth of healing and I will be healing until I die, I keep saying. But I did, a, you know, I took the cancer out. I got, I removed the cancer and that journey, as painful and as difficult as it was, created a process. It created I became the healer. I became the, I felt I found certain solutions. First, it was strategy. You know, this is how you should be. And then it became a, a more holistic, more internal journey. And then I started sharing that, you know, my heart at the time, now I've got this whole, you know, mandate and assignment to reach 1 billion women. But in the beginning, I just thought if I can save one woman, from ever going through what I've gone through, that'll be enough. So I had no idea it would become what it has become. Uh, I'm catching up with what's, what it's becoming. I just wanted to help one woman. I just wanted to share what I learned with some girl who was probably out there having a heart broken. And that was, that was it. But I started my YouTube channel because when my son would be with his dad, I would be bored. I wasn't dating because usually I'd go on dates. But this time I'm not going on dates. I'm sitting there watching. Uh, and I thought, I'll do a YouTube channel and I'll share with one girl. Nobody's going to want to know what I have to say, but, but one person might, you know. And I recorded maybe about 10 videos that were kind of fun and, you know, happy and, you know, exciting because I thought that was the YouTube thing to do at the time. And I forgot about it. I think I had two subscribers, myself and my best friend and 10 views, which is my friend and my best friend watching those videos. And about six months later, I remember picking up my phone. I was in bed. I hadn't gone to work and I saw my phone and there was all these emails. So I was like, who on what? Because I'd stopped recording. I just thought nobody cares, you know. And it was women from all over the world. Women from Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, Australia. The world had discovered me. And in those emails were women saying, you've changed my life. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for what, you know, and then it's sort of, can you do a video on this? Can you do a video on that? And the requests that are coming in. And I realized, oh my God, people are actually watching and people actually see value in what I do. But again, I still didn't see it as a business or a movement or it really wasn't what it is now. To me, it was, yeah, yeah I get to help somebody. And I was helping. And, you know, eventually I'm at work and I'm responding to emails from troubled women. And eventually I had to sort of decide, what are you going to do? You know, you can't, you can't shortchange your boss because my boss was starting to notice. I remember one time you stole my phone, like it was becoming a problem. So one day I just bravely decided, you know, this is it. I need to go and help. I need to serve women. I need to, this is my calling. This is my purpose. And 
I remember quitting my job with no salary, no income and a child at home, but just really deeply being convicted that I needed to do this full time and be available. And that is the first time I actually then had my very first client and charged for the for the service. And I had I was, you know, like, oh, my goodness, somebody wants to pay me to help them. And, you know, you know, the book that I wrote position for I do became was born and that became an international bestseller and that, you know, so everything I am today was kind of by accident, but that is really my story. And my mission is obviously to heal and bring health to, to everybody when it comes to relationships, because they are life. And when they go wrong, it breaks us in ways very few things can. So that is a long version of my story. I love all of that. I'm literally jotting down all kinds of notes because I want to come back and circle circle the few things that I'd love to come back to. But right. I love that you said by accident. Yeah. <laughs> was it by accident? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we found God and Jesus knew there is no accidents because what was happening to you was actually happening for you. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. What a Absolutely. story. So thank, thank you for you. sharing all of that. I mean, because it, it takes a lot of courage, you know, the vulnerability to really own the messy part of our lives, the parts that we try to piece together so perfectly that we mask it all because we don't want people to see our hurt because if they no. see the hurt, they'll see yeah. really that mess and ugliness that's inside and think, well, I'm not going to be loved. I'm not going to be worthy. They're not yes. going to see the value in this yes. broken piece of yes pain. yes oh my goodness how much i relate to so much of what you shared wow. and while we walk completely different lives and live in completely different countries the the humanity and the unity of what pain brings together it brings right. together people yes and we're all craving that healing we're craving the connection we're craving something to get us out of this pain point and yes. as we're embarking on this journey and realizing that this isn't where I imagined my life to be. I didn't get married to fall apart. I'm married yeah. out of love and thinking that this was going to be my forever. And then yeah. I realized that there's so much trauma. There's so much unhealing areas of my life that I will continue to bleed onto those if I don't heal that and mend it and heal those wounds. So mm -hmm. I love that you you bring all this to the table because it really shows and not only of your story, but the works and the compassion and the empathy and the understanding of how you can really relate to your clients into the works that you do. So I want to yeah. commend you on that because I Thank know that you. this this is not an easy, easy job and this is not an easy no. uh, task to take on to heal yourself from the inside out. And right. I think for it. For those that are listening, the question is that I want to prompt to you guys is at what point do we try to mask our pain because we're, there's a lot of shame or fear to go back to those areas that feel so messy, ugly, and scary. But mm -hmm. as, as Chaney shared, there's so much power, right? We hear that mm -hmm. message. Your pain is your purpose. And there's so much power in the pain and the struggle because when you have strength in yourself to come over or overcome these challenges and these narratives and the beliefs about ourselves how much more power that we are now exhibiting and empowering others and giving them hope and giving them life and giving them the courage to go after what they need to tackle in their life with confidence and faith and believing there's yes. so need for so much more than what is happening to us. So Absolutely. You that. You're oh so welcome. God. Oh my goodness. So my, my question is, as you're coming up through this journey and you realize now when you kept saying, I just wanted to help that one person. And you yeah. realize now that mirror holding up, you were yeah. that one person. Yes. And you became that spark and a light for those others. So yeah. as you're, on, as you're coming up in this journey and you're realizing now how much now your your struggles were a place where you can speak about them to teach to educate and helping mm -hmm. those other women 
what were some of those questions that were coming up? What were the narratives that these women were asking you for advice for and help? Because those listening, tune in because these might be your questions or feel like the questions that you're asking yourself that nobody else would ask or that they're a dumb question or, oh, I'm just on this journey alone. Would you mm. mind sharing some of those questions that those women were reaching out to you about? Absolutely. You know, they kind of ranged from, I can't attract a partner for whatever reason. I don't understand. I'm a good woman. I'm beautiful. I'm kind. I have all of these virtues and values, but I can't attract a partner. And I don't know why. And there are a lot of people in the world who genuinely cannot attract a partner. And that's obviously that deeper inner work of unworthiness. That's that deeper work of not showing up in the world, hiding, you know, and all of which is we know is kind of rooted in, in our trauma. But there are women who literally have never had a boyfriend in their 30s, 40s. You know, they've never had a connection with a man. And so that was, you know, I, 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 I want to learn how to attract a partner. The next one was I can attract partners, but I can't keep them. You know, I, I, for some reason they leave, for some reason they abandon me sometimes, you know, or I leave and I abandon. So I can't get love to stay. I can't get connection. I can't build a connection in my attachments that can kind of, you know, endure. The next one was I have found love. I have found connection, but I am truly unhappy. I am. I'm unfulfilled. My needs are not met. I am at the end of my rope. I am, and I don't know what to do because again, we're, we're saving ourselves, right? So it's that person who was in that place where my faith, my faith says different. Am I not having enough faith? I'm up. What is going on? So a lot of women who are really fighting for their marriages, fighting for their relationships, but they're just with a person who's not fighting with them. Or they or they're making mistakes or they made a mistake in the earlier dynamic. But the 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 question is, I found love. I managed to keep love, but love is breaking me, love is hurting me, right? So it's usually in and around those three kind of stages that women find themselves. And later on in my practice and in my work, it was, you know, I found love, I kept love. I was miserable in love and now I have to walk away from love and I need help walking away. So these are your divorced people. These are your people coming out of toxic uh, relationships. These are your people that are stuck in narcissistic dynamics and need support to kind of untangle. And, you know, you then get different variations, but it's, it's different stories. Everybody has a different story, but that would be the kind of core questions, those four areas. Those four well, yeah, and c because you had mentioned, you know, just the un the unworthiness right. makes somebody feel like they are not attracting the right individual. And so to answer some of those questions, what does it mean then to attract that right person? Because I, I, I know where this could go and I would love your take and your perspective <laughs> on it because yeah. that's you who's kind of wondering, yeah, that's me. I, I can attract the right person, but I'm just so unfulfilled or... I feel like I'm always finding love in all the wrong places and, yeah. you know, all the, all the things, right? So what would you say to the, to these women that are looking to attract the right person? How do they need to see themselves in that context? Right. I think it's in the clue you gave me earlier about myself when you're saying I wanted to reach one person, but that was just me. I was trying to reach, right? That's what you were able to show me. That was great insight. I love that. I'm going to steal that and run away with it. It's basically the same principle. We really truly have been conditioned, scripted to believe that love exists outside of us. The connection, the most valuable connection is the one we make beyond us. That the soulmate is beyond you. And the journey truly is to recognize that you are your own soulmate. The right person, so I always say to people, the right person for me is myself in another, is the healed version of me, the loving version of me in my opposite but equal. So my right person is Chengi in a man's body, right? With all of the strengths where I am weak, but we're the same energy, we're the same spirit, we're the same assignment, we're the same human. And, and 
so to know him is to know me to recognize him is to recognize me at a very deep level to to develop that really deep self-awareness that is not just accepting of what makes me amazing and great and powerful because that's hard enough for us as women but also accepts the parts of me that I would rather reject and just deny just own you know parts of me that are me that I, I would rather not deal with I need to be accepting and embracing of all of who I am and that then makes the picture of Chengi right and when I can accept me, I can accept another. When I can be safe with my shadow, with my darkness, with my inadequacies, albeit I'm taking a personal development journey to become a better human, I first have to accept myself. You know, I'm sure if we take it out of the soul part and bring it to the body part, I remember when I eventually got a hold on my health and wellness is when I stood in front of the mirror naked and thought, I accept you. I accept you overweight. I accept you with your cellulite. I accept you with accept you and if you never changed I would still accept you but I love you so much that we're going to do something about it and that was the first time ever in my life I got a handle on my health and well-being my my fitness my my eating habits but beforehand it was I hate you oh it's disgusting I want to take a knife and slice <laughs> that these are the thoughts I would have about myself so you know when you approach your health and wellness with that sense of you are you are beautiful you are perfect in every way but the journey as we journey towards love and as we journey towards loving ourselves more I'm going to feed you better I'm going to move you better I'm going to make better choices small like you know I was listening to your podcast today and like small decisions every day because I love you right because I accept you not because I hate you because when we hate ourselves we punish our bodies right we put it in this punishment the same thing with our souls you know when we can, I recognize you because I've learned to love me as I am from this place with everything good and bad. I recognize myself. So now I can recognize you and you will therefore become the person that I'm looking for, that I will magnetize to myself, that God will bring to me. But a lot of us, we're seeking a soulmate. We're looking, we're looking in, in the cloud. We don't even know who we are. So I always say to my clients, what are your core needs? You know, to know your cornies needs to know who you are, because what I need from a man is not what Rachel needs. So the long answer to your very good question is the right person is the person that is you and your opposite and equal. And that's a journey you take personally to unfold. I love how you just broke that down, because what you're sharing there, just again, I can so relate because as it, as I share in my, my book, Chasing Perfection, A Journey to Healing, Fitness, and Self-Love. Wow. That is exactly how I saw myself. When I would look in the mirror, I saw everything that was disgusting, that was ugly, that had been just, you know, my, my own sense of used and abused, the things that were just how I perceived myself. And I had the opposite approach where I would turn to health and fitness as a way to control and manipulate my body so that I could love it. But the minute yeah. I had to disconnect from that self, that reflection was the mm -hmm. first time I was able to turn inward and start healing myself and asking, yeah. well, what is it that I truly need? And I mm -hmm. said, I just want to feel safe in this body. I want to feel loved in this body. Yeah. And then start asking myself, well, what does that love look like? What does it feel like? I said, mm. strong, confident, and powerful. Mm. And I said, then when I asked, answer my own question, what does that look like again? What are you doing to exhibit strength and courage and confidence? And I said, I would do all these things. And then I started doing those things. I was right. nourishing and healing my relationship from having eating disorders to disordered eating. I started now looking at food as a way to nourish and love this body because I was going to love that reflection regardless because I know how right. I'm to hate it and I knew mm. the feeling and the hatred that was inside of me I knew it was coming out in all different areas of my life not just in the relationship with my husband but the way I spoke to and about myself the way I carried myself the way I believed in thought and the limiting beliefs about myself and I said this is doing nobody any service especially myself because I'm trapped in this body I have to learn, learn to love it 
because it's the only place I will live and dwell for the rest of my life here on this earth. Wow. The way you broke that down was so profound. So I just want to thank you for sharing that and simplifying it in a way that even allowed me to see, yeah, that's what I was doing. But I articulated it a little bit differently, but I love that you gave a visual for that. So, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. (laughs) But going back to how you were saying you started caring about yourself and what your core needs are to know who you are. Right. So my question to you is, who is Changi? You know, I am an ever-evolving, ever-growing human. And, you know, it's so funny because I was just having a prayer time before I came on here. And I am love, I am power, and I am grace. Right? That's what I would say in terms of love being the journey to learn to love myself and then personifying it for others. You know, it's it's such a beautiful journey and also identifying with him who is love and just feeling like I'm the daughter of love. So I must be love. So I am love and I give love and love heals. I love love. Love has was my core wound. My lack of being loved, my lack of worthiness of love was a core wound for me. So my healing journey has brought me to the place where I am honored and privileged to be the face of love, the heart of love, the, you know, the, and I, and power being in order for us to transform the world, we need power to move hearts and to move minds. And that confidence comes with knowing that you have the power. For me, it certainly comes from knowing that I, I've got power and I'm assigned, you know, and so. I would say that if you were to meet me in person, and this is what a lot of people say back to me, that they feel seen, they feel heard, they feel known. My clients say that about me. If you spend time with me, you're going to feel seen, heard, and known. But you're definitely going to meet a very powerful person because it really lies in my convictions rather than ego. You know, it's in my conviction that I'm assigned to to change this world to make it better, to heal the hearts of people. So, but sure, I feel a scent, I feel scent for sure. So this is a lot, you know, my identity, which therefore informs my core needs as a woman. Um, You know, again, if you are a woman that is sent, you've got a business, you've got a ministry, you've got something bigger than you that you're working at, then your core need is different probably from, an average woman, for instance, I hate the word average, but a woman with a different life, <laughs> you know, I need, I don't need a power player as a partner. That's not a core need of mine. You know, a lot of women are like, I want a man who's powerful, who's going to da, 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 da. I need a Joseph. You know, I need a man who is capable of taking care of a seed that he did not plant in my spiritual womb. Mm. And be able to do the battle that comes with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Joseph didn't put Jesus in Mary's womb, right? But he was charged to protect it, to father it, to not to compete with it, not to make it separate or anything, but to really feel that his assignment was to protect the baby and the mother against everything. You know, he had to put his reputation on the line. There were a lot of things. So my core need is really for such a man. So when I would write down my core needs, I don't I don't need a power player. I don't need a big boss. I, you know, it's not what my personal core need is. It's it's definitely a protector, a man who is very insightful, spiritual and, and prophetic. So, you know, we then I then craft that based on who I perceive myself to be and becoming as well because we're we're all becoming aren't we yeah oh my goodness that that has been the way the way that you are articulating everything I feel like you're speaking to my soul and it's so beautiful and it's so profound because also similar journey that was something I had to recognize as well and you know even when it comes to to marriage or those you know whether you're married or not, I'm just sharing a bit of mine. Like my husband mm-hmm. and I are coming up on our 15th year wedding anniversary. Mm-hmm. But I, thank you. And 
So when I was in a place of self-hatred, I expected yeah. to step up and be this, this man of everything, to be the hero, yeah. the protector, the everything that we see of what a man should be. Yeah. But, and it's not to say that he's not, but I realized I needed to also cultivate that from, for myself. I need to, to heal myself and love myself. And as a woman who is deeply embedded in her faith as well, I know who God has called me to be. So right. once he has redeemed and restored me, he has given me everything that I need that I don't need to look externally out yeah. there in the world. And especially in my partner, because my yeah. husband is called just to be him the way that God is. Right. right. So for me to think that my husband needs to conform to what Rachel wants or needs is discounting and discrediting that God had created him, not the way that I needed. So as if I'm being the creator. And that's right. Not, that's not who we are as as, as individuals, right. as children of of the, the one true king who had created us. Absolutely. The unity of our marriage. And when I was able to discern that for myself, because I realized, listen, Rachel, you got to go work on you. Who does God see you as and who do you believe that you are and align those two? And now that took the pressure and the expectation off of me placing on my husband indirectly or directly. And mm -hmm. I think that this comes to the point of what are we putting out there for our partners that we're trying to attract, right? So mm -hmm. we need to come to our come to the table as a whole self, heal, right. recover, right. love. And knowing where our identity comes from in the first place, because a man is not ever going to complete us. They're going to come no. up with us. Absolutely. And that's the difference. So, Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for sharing that, because what a, you know, again, an eye opener, even for myself, because sometimes when you come through all these years of doing the inner work, you're reminded of how far you came and all the good right. notes that came from it. So this is exactly right. what this conversation is doing for me. Um, oh, wow. God. I'll tell you what, Rachel, before you ask your next question, I must add this because you really just, you know, this is really good. You know, we, Harvard did a study, I think in the 90s. I haven't uh, seen anything more recent. But basically what they came up, they interviewed some couples and all different sorts of couples. And then they came to the conclusion that we only get 51% of what we need in a mate. That's in a really good relationship. That's like, a thriving relationship. You're only ever going to get 51% of what you want. A lot of people think they get more than that. And a lot of my clients are like, that's a bit mean, isn't it? I mean, 51%, right? So that really sets expectations as to when you do well and you do your corners and you bet properly and you do everything the way God wants you to do it, his, God is giving you 59, 51%. And I always say, reason is God will not share his glory with anybody, right? There is nothing in our lives, not our career, not relationships that will fill our cup completely. We are supposed to be at a deficit. Mm -hmm. So where do you get the other 49%? You get that from you showing up for you. So like you said, just to buttress the point that you made, when I come at 100%, my partner can only fill my cup halfway, but I'm responsible for the other half. I'm responsible for that 49%. And that's where my faith comes in. And that's where God comes in because he designed everything on the planet to never fulfill you because he will never share his glory. He, will, he won't have you serving any other gods. You know, sometimes in scripture, in scripture it says, thou shalt not serve any other god. We think it's about an idol that you're going to bow before and worship. Is anything that you perceive is going to fulfill you completely. You've turned that into God. That is idolatry. and we, you know, I always say to women, especially when women are going towards marriage, they've made marriage an idol. You know, mm -hmm. when I meet my partner, when I get married, I'm going to be fulfilled, right? And then it's a rude awakening when they're not fulfilled. So, you know, this is exactly what you were saying is we need to come full, you know, full of faith and full of hope. And our cup will drain this world will drain our cup. And this is where our partner comes in. That's why he sent them out two by two. So your partner comes in, but your partner can only do half. You got to bring the rest and, and that responsibility. And I think if everybody understood that to be the science, the spiritual science, the God science and man social science, we would have better expectations and 
better readiness and better preparation for, for marriage. And we would go in a little bit fuller. I went into my marriage empty, completely empty. Yeah. You know, and that's where divorce comes from. It, you know, it comes from that. Yeah. From that, the emptiness with the expectation that somebody will complete you, complete you or fulfill you. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even, even, you know, when I look back at, so my husband and I have been together a total of 19 years at this point, but married for, wow. for 15 coming up. And, mm -hmm. you know, I look back and I'm like, I wasn't, I was definitely not the same person I was then as I am now, but mm -hmm. we were two young individuals. Just, we, we had fun and we were attracted to each other. And so sometimes that's just yeah. like the baseline just to, you know, make it. Right. Yes. What yes. The beauty of a marriage is to grow together, but grow yeah. separately as individuals so that you can come yes. together as a, as a partner and, you know, fulfilling one and each other. So it's like, you know, one day that I'm operating at um, 40%, he shares the 60 and vice versa. Right. Right. It's also the, the conscious choice to choose every day to love because love is not right. always going to be the butterflies and the kittens and the oohs and yeah. the oohs. Mm. And that will never sustain over time forever and no. ever because no. life happens and things no. happen, mm. but it's a choice. And that same choice is how you choose to show up to love yourself on a daily. Yeah. And yes. that's the forgiveness to yes. take pardon of the mistakes and the mishaps that how we've mistreated or the things that we have said to and about ourselves. So I'd love mm -hmm. to share a little bit about that, of what it means to unconditionally love yourself and making passes and giving yourself the same extension of grace and forgiveness that we would like extended into others as well. I love that. You know, my biggest hurdle to really coming into the fullness of my healing was my inability to show myself compassion my inability to show myself forgiveness. The hardest person to love is ourselves because we know too much of our darkness. We know too much of our pain. You know, forgiving somebody who's transgressed outside of us, we can tell ourselves a story about their internal reality and maybe find a way to forgive them. But for ourselves, we are harsh critics. That harsh critic inside of us won't let us go. And that harsh cricket, crit, critic is the one that makes the trauma live and survive and thrive in our hearts. And then we project that pain on our partner. Then he becomes a disappointment. Then he becomes this unfulfilled, then he becomes wrong. But it's really that projection of from within ourselves. And, you know, self-compassion, practicing self-compassion is something that I, that I have to consciously, intentionally and deliberately do. Now, a lot of people would say, well, if you're taking yourself off the hook so much, are you allowing yourself to actually face your stuff and, or are you just letting yourself off the hook? You know, I did that well. I feel, you know, I'm just going to be compassionate. So I'm not going to actually work on this. Actually, when you have self-compassion, it has the reverse. It doesn't allow you to get yourself off the hook. It gives you the fuel to begin the work to heal and be better. So for me, it was, you know, the voice in my head, you stupid cow, you did it again. What's wrong with you? And, you know, what I learned through therapy, through my conversations with the Holy Spirit was really, did you do that because you're an evil, wicked human being? Did you make that choice because you truly profoundly believe you are rotten to the core? And the answer would always be, no, I didn't intend to hurt them or me or create this, this thing just happened. And it's about realizing what part of you needed that, what part of you. So I realized that let's take men, for example, I'm sure some of your listeners who are single and you come out of this relationship, you think, what was I bloody thinking? You know, he was such a moron. I saw the signs from day one. I mean, he literally all but had the flag in front of me waving it, you know, the red flag. And I still went into it. What is wrong with me? I'm so stupid, right? We use that, that kind of language. And showing yourself self-compassion is looking at it differently and saying, you weren't stupid. There was a need you were trying to meet. You have an unmet need. That unmet need, I just wanted to be seen. 
It's been so long since anybody ever saw me. So even though I saw the red flag, the need, the unmet need within me was so strong that I was simply a girl trying to meet a need. That takes the narrative to a whole different conversation. And then we can begin to say, what was the need? To be seen, to be recognized, to be known, to, you know, he saw me. You know, I, for, for a minute, I wasn't invisible in the world. And guess what? Our, one of our deepest needs in this world is to be seen, known. Love is to be seen, to be known, to be heard and understood for who we are. And if we can get it, we need love the way we need oxygen, right? We, we so need love as human souls to thrive in this world. And a piece of love, you know, when you've, you're tired, you're exhausted. You know, I, I'll tell you a personal story of when I got engaged in this journey of mine and the engagement fell apart and it was public and embarrassing and all these things. And I remember God gave me a book that is yet to be published one day. It's still in my archives. But it was really showing me what that God was really taking me on the self-compassion journey and saying, Chengi, you were exhausted. You were working till 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. You had been doing all of these things. You had been serving and serving and serving and serving. And that woman just needed somebody to come and serve back so desperately that she didn't even qualify the person who was doing the serving. And that's okay, baby girl, because what we need to do now is take you on a, on a rest journey. So that then brought me to greater healing, a better version of myself because I realized something about myself so I wouldn't repeat it. When you're tired, Chingy, you're going to make some really seriously bad relationship decisions, life decisions. So don't work yourself to the bone. I no longer stay up at 4 a.m. because I know how dangerous it is for me to do that. I rest as much as possible because I understand what happens to me. So now I came out of that by showing myself self-compassion understanding why I did it, the need I was trying to fill, what made me vulnerable. I'm now discovering how Chengi works. What makes Chengi vulnerable to Satan, to the world, to manipulation, to exploitation? I understand myself better. So through that act of self-compassion, I govern and self, I have better self-mastery, better self-management. I'm healing parts of me that I would have never healed if all I'd said to myself is, you stupid idiot. You saw the red flag. You're just ridiculous. You got yourself into this mess. Live in it. If I just ended the conversation there, I was going to repeat the cycle because I wouldn't have known. I would have continued. The, the, every outcome we have has a lifestyle behind it. Every outcome that we produce, there's something that fires it, that brings us. So when we see us make that mistake or make that mess, we think it just happened. And if we don't practice self-compassion, if we don't practice self-forgiveness, then we can't heal it. We don't even know where to begin. Right. Oh, I love the deep reflective questions that you are asking yourself because it's so needed and necessary, right? Because if, if you did, you'd keep that cycle and you keep wondering, why do I keep attracting right. the wrong person? Why? And you would think, what is wrong with me? Which then is a self-fulfilling prophecy for what you've already believed about yourself and so you're going to continue attracting like attracts like. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, those questions are so needed. And we tend to think like, oh, but I don't even have those conversations with myself. I'm not even at that level to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And it will bring me back to my a quote that my mother always said to me when I was younger. It wasn't a quote, it was what she'd said. And I said, what does my mom know? But she always mm -hmm. You have to be your own best friend first before you can be somebody else's. Yeah. And late into adult life, you realize, okay, your mother was right. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the journey is dating yourself, getting to know yourself, asking yourself those questions. Because when you can get to learn and understand yourself on those deeper levels, you can go deeper on those questions and in intimacy with a partner where you can really get to know them from the ins and outs because you've known yourself. But if we only play at the surface level, to Changi's point, you're only going to accept the surface of what you're accepting. And mm. that's not what we're truly after because love doesn't live on the surface. Love lives deep within. And that right. is in our core, in our soul. And when we come to recognize that we were created with love and on yeah. purpose through our creator, we might not have felt it with our parents, 
But yeah. we are heavenly divine beings sent right. here through God. God created us with, on, and for a purpose. So when we know who we are, we know whose we are, and that is something that can't be taken away. That is our God-given right and our purpose. So when we're accepting mistreatment from others, we have to ask, how are we treating ourselves? And that goes back to what we just shared at throughout this whole throughout right. this whole conversation. Right. Oh my goodness. So yeah. oh my gosh. As we as we wrap things up, I would love for you to share some final thoughts and uh, of course how our listeners can learn more about you and follow along with you and your journey and all the things that you have going on in your in your life. Wow, for sure. My you can all find me on social media. It's all Black Swan Relationship Academy. YouTube is where it's happening. I've got a brand new podcast that I'm having fun recording at the moment on my channel. And you, you'll learn tons. Instagram is great for little knickknacks. But for me, my assignment is to educate and to teach. You know, uh, Jesus says, go you and told the world and make disciples. You know, I think we've all done a great job of conversions. But discipleship comes through education, teaching. And I, you know, in all my conversations with women, it was always, oh, my God, I wish I knew that. Oh, I wish somebody had told me that when I was 20. If only I'd known that when I was 18. And I've had those conversations with myself. Goodness, if I knew now what I knew at 18 when I landed in this country, geez, I would have had four kids. You know, you can see a different journey. And you're always grateful for where you are because everything happens for a reason. Like you said, there are no accidents. But I've heard so many women over the years, thousands and thousands of women say, good Lord, I wish I knew that. And women saying, I wish my daughter knew that. I'm, can, you te can we teach my daughter? So I knew at some point when God said to me, I want you to teach one billion women. It was clear that the assignment was education, was teaching. And so I am not here to be one of the many advisors and of people giving advice on the internet based on whatever I think. My job is really to educate and to teach and to help people understand piece by piece. The Bible says, you know, you must understand the word, you know, word for, you know, precept upon precept, word upon word, because, you know, being able to systematically understand something a layer at a time, I'm a very kind of, I like things to be logical and rational to make. And even though the core of my, you know, my clients like me because I'm a Christian and they feel that they can get that connection. A lot of my clients are not either. And so these, what I went on to do was create courses that would help women really understand the science of attraction, the spirituality of attraction, the, you know, everything that you can need, whether it's the dating playbook, it's, it's, it's my A to Z of how you should date as a high value woman a woman of virtue and values in that course so many, many hours. And, but in there, you're going to learn how to date as a Christian, how to, you know, a lot of women are like, you know, I'm not supposed to have sex before marriage. What am I supposed to do? Right. That's, that's the concern of, you know, most women of faith. And, you know, in there, I tell you how to navigate those conversations, how to actually navigate that part. So there's a whole playbook and in the playbook, you also, you know, I'll also have stuff for people who are not believers who are going to have sex, but how are they going to have that conversation? And they are believers that, you know, they, they just haven't been able to fulfill that path. But how can we do this safely, as safely as humanly possible so we don't create and incur too much damage? How do we have these conversations about sex, about whether your faith communicating, your standards, your values? So, you know, I've got, you know, those details things. I've got things about what to say, exactly what to say. You know, dating is tough. And Sometimes, you know, clients are like, I don't know what to say when he says this. I've got a whole, you know, product there to really help you say this, scripts, literally to support. But, and whether it's emotional mastery, a lot of the stuff that we've spoken about here today, you know, why can I not have my emotions under control? How do I practice self-compassion? So, you know, so everything that you could imagine, whether you're in a relationship or whether you're single, that you would need to really educate yourself and really understand the psychology, male, female psychology, the science, the biology, the stats. I am, I want every single person who goes through the Black Swan Relationship Academy to be their own expert. You know, I believe that you should be the own, your own expert on your own life, on your own love life. So I have created the academy to not be personality based, to not be centered around 
changing. I'm not trying to be a celebrity. I'm trying to change the world and fulfill my assignment. So I've created it in such a way that the downloadable courses, you just literally go to the, to the website and there's a whole shop with tons of courses that will literally transform your life. And I have one signature course that I developed that is really the culmination, the spinal cord of my life's work. So if I died today, God forbid, after this podcast, I my dream would be that every woman would do the Soulmate Attraction System course because that is what I created through this journey with, honestly, with the help of the Holy Spirit who helped me put it together because it's phenomenal. And I'm like, there's no way I could have done that. That's Jesus, right? But it takes you through a three-month journey where you will uncover, recover, heal, see, see your trauma, see your wounds, and you'll have a coach holding your hand through it. It is created the biggest transformations in my in my practice, the biggest transformations in my world. If you're stuck and you know, whether you need to heal your marriage, whether you need to, you know, get love, this is such a powerful course. It is, it is the course that I Hopefully when I die, I'll say, you know, what, one billion people did this course and therefore, God, it is finished. You know, I wouldn't be able to say it is finished. So I am definitely a woman on a mission. I am ridiculously focused because, you know, we're all going to pass. And we, I, my greatest desire is to be able to say, look, it, it is finished. I've done my part. So, yeah, yeah. I've created everything to be of service in my presence or absence. So yeah, that's, that's really what, what I'm working on right now. And I'm also inviting people who feel called to join me as a coach. I'm creating my professional coaching training and it's going to be the best in the world. I know that for a fact because I know what God is doing. So this, this course, this professional training for you to become a relationship coach is part of what I believe is the relationship revolution and reformation because we need we need something real and deep, and I, I need a million soldiers to help me on this assignment. So I'm still working and building this, but I am inviting anybody who wants to enroll and become a coach to jump on board. Let's change the world together. You know, I can't reach one billion women by myself. You know, we need a whole army. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what Cheng is working on. That's, what, that's the assignment for now. I hope that was a lot. <laughs> no. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, great great detail of all that because I, I really want somebody to experience what it would be like to go through your programs, to be a part of your community, to be a part of what your legacy and what you're building. Because as you said, for us, we can't do it single-handedly. We need more than just ourselves. So, oh my goodness, Absolutely. thank you. Today's conversation has just been profound, completely just levels that I love living at and going and exploring. <laughs> I just want to thank you for, for bringing your light, love, and joy to me and my heart, because this has thank been um, just so fulfilling for me. And I hope, you know, our listeners, if, if that's you as well, and be sure to reach out to Changi. And of course, everything will be included in the show notes below. So if today's episode resonates with you, make sure to shoot her a message. Let her know, like, this is what we yeah. do. We share our hearts and our passions and, and, our, wow. and our love for others to bring it to the works and the conversations that we host here on the podcast. So thank oh. you, Tammy. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time on your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hey there. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Confident Woman Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did, please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Thanks again for listening. 